young life span with a particular interest in pediatric and clinical populations. Melita's recent work has focused on the development of home-based rehabilitation strategies for people experiencing vulnerability, which is a very important topic uh, lately, and the interaction between air pollution and physical activity in determining Melita is a research lead for the Welsh Institute of Physical Activity, Health and Sport. Without any further ado, I invite uh, Melita to tell you uh, uh, in our presentation. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for everybody for, for staying when we all know that the sequel is never as good. Um, <laughs> So when I was doing my research like Kelly as to what a good inaugural lecture is, and by that I do mean asking ChatGPT, um, it said that it needed to have a well-defined focus, be interactive and engaging, and to have a personal element to it. So I've decided to focus today's talk on some of the work we've been doing in respiratory conditions, which are the third leading cause of death globally, and that's before COVID-19 and its ongoing ramifications. It's also interesting to note that the UK has some of the worst disease outcomes for respiratory conditions across Europe and indeed across the globe, as indicated by the dark red colouring of the UK here. And this has persisted for well over 30 years in both females and males. Now, respiratory conditions are characterised by a lack of research funding, but also by a general lack of awareness, um, understanding and empathy with many people considering respiratory conditions to be solely a smoker's disease and having little concept of the many other causes there are for respiratory conditions, such as poor housing, um, poor air quality, or genetics. So to give some of you um, an understanding as to what it is to live with respiratory diseases, you will all see in front of you two straws, a wider one and a more narrow straw. And this is me trying to tick off that interactive box, admittedly. Um, what I would like you to do, and this is also going to suitably distract you so I can get the personal bit out of the way at the same time, um, is to first of all breathe through the wider of the two straws whilst pinching your nose closed. In a minute, I will then ask you to swap for the more narrow straw. And while you're doing that, you all started slightly sooner than I anticipated, which is fine, but just <laughs> don't, don't pass out on me. Um, while you're doing that, I want you to think about how you're breathing. Are you having to breathe faster? Are you having to work harder to breathe? Do you feel that you're not getting enough air in? So right now, while you're distracted, um, the journey, how I got to where I am. Well, that's a question I had to ask myself quite a lot when trying to put this together. And I'd love to say that it was all a grand plan, a master plan. But in reality, there was absolutely no plan whatsoever. This is just a series of events with a great big dollop of luck along the way. So this all started with a biosciences degree at the University of Exeter, which came about as a result of failing my A-levels pretty much and failing to get into the university of my choice and thinking whilst going through clearing that the best reason to choose your undergraduate degree was the fact that it had a field trip to the Bahamas. <laughs> um, I rapidly realised throughout this degree that bugs, plants and rocks really aren't my thing and I was very fortunate to meet Professor Kirsten Stoidfelk who was over doing a research sabbatical in the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre at the University of Exeter and whose daughter was persistently thrashing me at swimming at the time. Um, and she invited me to do my dissertation with her, which was looking at the influence of training in children. My PhD subsequently followed on from that. You can swap straws if you haven't already done so. Um, and went on to look at trying to challenge two key dogmas at the time. The first of which was that prepubertal children are not trainable, that if you undergo intensive training, you'll see no physiological adaptations in prepubertal children. And second of all, that girls didn't warrant to be researched. So... Throughout that, I was very fortunate to have the supervision of three great academics, starting with Dr. Joe Wellsman and going on to Professor Andy Jones and Dr. Alex Rowlands, who were without doubt my lifeline throughout my PhD. Towards the end of my PhD, I moved to Swansea University for a postdoc position, working with Hemir, who were a spin-out from the College of Engineering looking to develop an ambulatory artificial lung. And my role in that was to develop the models of cardiorespiratory control that would enable that ambulatory function, i.e., enable that device to respond to instantaneous changes in demand. And apparently I subsequently bought into the notion that Swansea is the graveyard of ambition as I've never yet left. Um, and we have since set up the Welsh Institute of Physical Activity, Health and Sport, which you've heard a bit about already. So now we've got that out of the way, 
Um, hopefully, by breathing through those straws, you've come to have a little bit of an appreciation of what it would be like to have a respiratory condition. And imagine what it would be like if I'd asked you to get up and walk around or walk up the stairs to the top of this lecture theatre. And that's the background, that's the context that all of the rest of this research is prefaced on. So imagine me telling you that you need to do more physical activity, more exercise, when sitting still is even a challenge. But that's what we're asking people to do. And we ask them to do that because we know that physical activity and exercise are highly potent stimulants. They are beneficial for the physiological, for the psychosocial domain outcomes. And they're so well recognized in terms of how effective they are that they have been endorsed ac across a multitude of different clinical conditions, including many respiratory conditions, by bodies such as the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. It's well recognized by clinicians, and they rate it as one of the most important aspects of their roles. And it's well recognized even by the patients themselves, with many citing that physical activity or exercise are the reasons why they're still alive. But despite this, as we heard in Kelly's talk, people are not sufficiently active. And that goes for people with clinical conditions and especially respiratory conditions as well, as is amplified here by children, in, uh, children with cystic fibrosis, which is the first of the respiratory conditions I wanted to discuss today. So cystic fibrosis is the most common inherited genetic disorder that influences multiple dif different systems across the body. And as you can see on the screen here, the children with cystic fibrosis, or well you can't because I've got a clicker, I haven't got a uh, laser. The children in black with cystic fibrosis were significantly less active than their healthy peers. And the really disturbing thing here is that it's not that their healthy peers were active, they were also inactive. So that's a really worrying indication as just to how little physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity, these children are engaging. And similar findings have been found in adults with cystic fibrosis with a little over 50% meeting the recommended guidelines. Now, these were some of the first um, device-based studies to look at physical activity levels in people with cystic fibrosis. And they provided us with a lot of insights. But what they did do is only concentrate on the moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is a small subset of the overall activity that we engage in throughout a day, representing typically only 4% of a person's day. And that's even if they engage in the recommended amount. So it took no consideration of the other intensities, and it also only provided us with an overall insight. It didn't give us any of the nuances about how that physical activity had been accrued. So if you take two people, you've got one person who goes out for a run in the morning, but then perhaps he has a largely sedentary job and stays sitting down for the rest of the day. You've got someone else who doesn't go for a run in the morning, potters around throughout the day, doesn't sit down a lot. They both accrue the same amount of physical activity across the day, but which one of those two patterns is preferable? Which one has the strongest health outcomes? That's a question that we've sought to investigate over a series of studies. The first of which was when uh, we looked across the various different activity intensities, including splitting light physical activity into high light and low light, which I think is mostly done to make it impossible to say. Um, and what you can see, first of all, is that there was no difference between the children with and the children without cystic fibrosis. So contrast in those earlier studies. But in agreement with them, they still weren't making that 60 minutes a day on average. The other thing that we found when we looked into this was we wanted to see which of these intensities was predictive of lung function, obviously one of the key outcomes for children with cystic fibrosis. And what we found was it was high light physical activity that was most strongly correlated with FEV1 or force expiratory volume in one second. Now, this may be an indication that we've been focusing on the wrong domain because all of our interventions focus on promoting moderate to vigorous physical activity. Or it could be an indication that we've misclassified the intensity of activity that these children have been engaged in. So in addition to what Kelly mentioned in terms of most of our um, cut points are developed using linear, method, linear modalities only, they are also almost exclusively developed for healthy populations. And this fails to account for the different resting and, en and e exercise-based energy expenditures in clinical populations. And this is exemplified on this graph here. So if you take the top line, which is four miles per hour, so that's two people, for example, walking at the same absolute exercise intensity. And if the person is over here towards the right-hand side of this graph of 14 minutes, they're very healthy. They've got a good overall cardiospiratory fitness. For them, walking at four miles per hour is pretty easy. It's considered light intensity activity. In contrast, as you shift towards the left side of this, you can see that for the person 
at the top here, this is actually beyond their maximal exercise capacity. They couldn't walk at four miles per hour. Yet we're going to use one arbitrary threshold and assume it fits all these different people. So if you, when we went to, on to look at this, we then developed um, CF-specific cut points with Mayara, who's in the audience today. Um, and we did it across multiple different devices and locations, which I won't go into. But just to highlight one key finding, if you look at this column here, you will see that the cut points for those with cystic fibrosis were significantly lower than they were for those without. So if we revisit this graph and consider that that highlight was supposedly indicative, what it's probably actually showing is that it was moderate intensity physical activity, highlighting that moderate to vigorous physical activity may indeed be the location that we should be focusing on. <coughs> Excuse me. We had bets on which of us was going to cough worst in our presentations. <coughs> um, so the next thing that we went on to look at was we've now got this in insight into how physical activity has been accrued, but we've largely treated these behaviours in isolation rather than considering the fact that they are all interrelated and they're all interlinked. We only have a finite amount of time in our day. If we increase one behaviour, it has to be at the consequence of decreasing another or numerous other behaviours. So we first looked at this and the bidirectional relationships between <coughs> um, your physical activity on one day, your sleep that night, and whether or not your sleep that night influences the subsequent day's physical activity. And what we found was that there was no relationship between sleep and physical activity in any direction, but there was a significant and important relationship between sleep duration and how much time you spent sedentary the following day, with greater sleep resulting in less time spent sedentary and more time spent sedentary resulting in less sleep. So this started to highlight the importance of not only considering moderate to vigorous physical activity, but also sleep. And this was further exemplified in some work we did looking at the composition of physical activity behaviours in those with cystic fibrosis. So this is trying to identify that optimal composition. Think back to those two people that I mentioned earlier. Which one has got the best outcome? Which is the best recipe for health? And clearly, sticky toffee pudding is just the best way to exemplify that. Um, so Kelly introduced the concept of compositional analysis earlier. When we looked at this for um, FEV1, what we found was that the strongest behaviours that had to be retained were sleep, and we should encourage multi um, moderate to vigorous physical activity, but at no point at the expense of sleep. So we can play around with light physical activity and sedentary time, but we should not take away from sleep in order to increase time spent in moderate to vigorous physical activity. So all of this work was helping us to identify where we should intervene and how we should intervene. And we were just at the point of developing our next physical activity intervention when CAFTRIO came along. For those of you who don't know, CAFTRIO is a triple modulator therapy which has revolutionized the life course for people with cystic fibrosis. So in, as opposed to just treating the symptoms, this is the first drug that is actually trying to um, resolve the, fun the fundamental dysfunctions. And it is working amazingly well. This is changing the life and giving many people hope that they previously had given up on. But there are also many questions that remain to be answered. And we were very fortunate to be able to set up um, a study, an observational study in children aged six to 12 years, because this was the last group that CAFTRIO was licensed for in the UK. And over the first six months of that, you can see just how dramatic the impact has been on these children's lung function. You've got significant improvements in forced expiratory volume, forced vital capacity, and in lung, climate, lung clearance index. And these might seem like modest improvements. We're not talking about huge changes until I put it in the context of what we would normally have seen over this time period. So in the top, you have FEV1. You can see how it, it progressively declines with age in children with cystic fibrosis and adults. And in the bottom, you have the typical response profiles we would see for lung clearance index. So those percentage increases and decreases might seem modest until you consider them in the fact that they're the opposite direction to what we would normally have seen. So CAFTRIO does appear to be living up to expectations in many ways. It is changing people's life course, but it's not without its limitations. And it's important that those limitations are considered. So we've been very lucky to do some qualitative work, and I never thought I'd put those words in the same sentence, <laughs> um, to understand what people's experiences have been of being on CAFTRIO. And whilst many of them have been 
enthusiastic about it and appreciated it. There was also a sense of loss of identity for many of them. They thought they knew what was ahead of them, even if it wasn't what they wanted, but suddenly that's been changed. And how can they cope with that? How can they readjust? And it was a feeling of being lost and that their clinical care teams weren't giving them the support they needed to readjust to that. And also that, how did they know it was gonna keep going? What happened if these effects stopped and they went back to where they were? How would they ever come to cope with that? But in addition to these, this introduction of CAF trio has also brought about a whole new potential phenotype of people with cystic fibrosis. And it's a phenotype associated with overweight and obesity because for the first time, much of the malabsorption issues associated with cystic fibrosis have been addressed. So suddenly this is a population who have been used to being very lean, very thin, not having to worry about what they eat and indeed actually being prescribed a high calorie, high fat diet, who now have to start watching what they eat because they're putting on significant amount of weight. And for some of them, that's having a very detrimental effect on their mental health to the point that some of them have reported stopping CAF trio, despite its potential, not life-saving, but certainly life-extending um, characteristics because it's influencing them that badly. So this is a massive new area that we need to work on. We need to address these issues. We need to come up with interventions that help them to become more physically active and to make the most of that time that they now have. Now this question about a new obesity related phenotype is one that also rings true for asthma, which is the second respiratory condition I'm gonna dwell on. So for many years, the prevalence of asthma has been dramatically increasing. And that's gone alongside increases in obesity and inactivity and concomitant declines in cardiorespiratory fitness leading to suggestions that there may be a whole new phenotype of asthma. And this is a question that we set out to investigate in around about 20,000 children. And what you can see is that perhaps, somewhat unsurprisingly, um, the children with asthma had a lower cardiorespiratory fitness as estimated by shuttle runs than their uh, non-asthma counterparts, that BMI was significantly associated with it. But the most interesting thing <coughs> is the point at which the decline in fitness started to occur and it wasn't occurring at the point that we anticipated. It's not occurring at the 85th or 95th percentile, which are typically associated with overweight and obesity. It's occurring right down there at the 50th percentile, highlighting a huge proportion of the population that may be at risk of low cardiorespiratory fitness and the associated poor health outcomes that we <coughs> never focus on. We worry about people at the 85th and above. We don't worry about that part of the population. So there's highlighted a whole new area where we need to focus some of our interventions. So having identified this potential relationship between BMI fitness and asthma, we set about trying to, to, to co-design a exercise intervention with Tom, who's in the audience today, was part of this study. So that um, intervention was co-developed. The adolescents supposedly told us what they wanted, how they wanted it to be implemented. And it resulted in just short of 600 children being randomized either to the intervention or to the control group. Those in the intervention were asked to undertake high intensity interval training three times a week for six months during a school year with a subsequent three month follow up period. Now we took a lot of measures during this, but I'm gonna specifically focus in on the subsample measures which were taken on around about 60 children. What we found with this intervention was that it was highly effective. We did manage to increase the children's aerobic fitness, as you can see on the top here. And we increased the aerobic fitness regardless of whether or not they had asthma and in those with asthma, those um, beneficial changes were maintained even after the cessation of the intervention. And these changes in maximal aerobic capacity were also demonstrated in the submaximal responses, where you can see here the dynamic response to an instantaneous change in demand. And you can see that on the intervention group, there was no change really between the pre and post measures, whereas in the control group, there was a significant uh, slowing of that response. So our intervention was able to maybe not speed them, but at least prevent the slowing, which is a, a very beneficial outcome. But despite the fact that we had co-designed this intervention, despite the fact that we refined the intervention in response to their feedback as we went along, and despite the fact it worked, they didn't like it. Um, and they didn't want to keep doing it, which would highlight that this is not going to be successful in the long run. You may also have noticed that this intervention did not increase their overall levels of physical activity. So all we, all we had really achieved was shifting their intensity, shifting the intensity of that activity, but not increasing the quantity of it. So in recognition of this, we've now moved on to try and identify where the optimal windows to intervene are. So there's two prongs to this. 
The first is, as Kelly highlighted earlier, identifying when children, especially, will be most receptive to intervention. There is no point trying to say, go outside and do something physically active when their preferred behavior at that point is playing with a video game. We're not going to win that argument. Activity is not that fun for most people. So we need to be smarter. We need to identify points when actually they're a little bit bored. Offering them another alternative action might be something they would engage in. But we also need to be more intelligent about where and when we promote that physical activity. And this is as we've become more and more mindful of the detrimental impacts of air pollution. So on the screen now is nine-year-old Ella, who sadly passed away in 2013 from an acute asthma attack, having, and was the first person in the world to have um, air pollution listed as her cause of death, having lived 25 metres from the South Circular in London. This highlights the massive effect that air pollution can have on our health, but it also raises a very interesting question. As sport and exercise scientists, we tout the benefits of physical activity and we claim that they outrank everything else. But by being more physically active, you're also increasing your exposure to, more likely than not, and intake of air pollution. So are we potentially negating some of those benefits of physical activity by exposing you to harm? And that's a question that a number of PhD students in the audience are working on at the moment. So the final condition that I wanted to discuss, as Arasio referred to in the introduction, is the work that we've been doing with long COVID. Now, I'm sure everyone is aware what long COVID is, but as a brief reminder, um, it's, well, it's, apparently I don't know what it is. Um, <coughs> long COVID is, I really don't know what it is. Um, read it on the screen, we'll move on. <laughs> um, so we know that long COVID is a massive issue. It's been es estimated to be influencing nearly 2 million people in the UK alone. And these are figures that haven't changed for well over a year. But despite its presence, despite the media interest around it, this is a condition that has been characterized by a lack of understanding and a lack of empathy. With many of the participants in the study I'm gonna go on to describe, um, telling us how they had been largely dismissed by their friends, their family, their medical care teams, told that they've been exaggerating and that they just need to calm down and get, back up, get on with it and get back to work. Now this lack of understanding and this um, unmet need for the patient voice to be heard led us to adopt a novel composite vignette approach to allow us to develop intricate character stories that portray the um, trajectories or experiences of people with long COVID. And I just wanna play you an extract from one of those vignettes as it does a far better job of describing what people have been experienced than I ever possibly could. It's been a long haul. The first few months were kind of all blended into one. And my journey doesn't seem to be going to end anytime soon. Initially, apart from just feeling really dreadful, I was scared. Scared about becoming critically unwell at home. Scared about the prospect of going into hospital. Scared about not knowing what was happening and scared about spreading it to others. At one point, I thought I was going to die. I've even written a will since then. The vignettes were very powerful. They were very hard to construct, but they've given us a unique insight into what the true lived experience has been. And perhaps one of the issues with people's understanding and people's um, ability to identify ways to treat long COVID is that it is an extremely heterogeneous uh, condition with well over 200 symptoms now recognized. Um, one of the top three of which, which is consistently reported and is also one of the most debilitating is breathlessness. Now breathlessness is extremely challenging in and of itself, as some of you maybe experienced a little while ago, but it's also associated with numerous additional consequences not least of which are things such as peripheral muscular fatigue and overall perceptions of fatigue. To try and explain and find the mechanistic basis for this breathlessness, many studies have been conducted and they've suggested a huge raft of different possible explanations, ranging from direct damage, inflammatory related damage to the alveoli, diaphragm dysfunctions and changes in neurorespiratory drive, all of which have culminated in significant respiratory muscle weakness and an imbalance between 
the demands being placed on the respiratory system and the respiratory system's capacity to address to meet those demands. Now, as I said, an increased cost of breathing, an increased amount of breathlessness is problematic in and of itself. But the impacts it has downstream were very nicely exemplified in this study back in um, the mid 2000s. And if you first of all concentrate on the two bars on the left hand side, I'm fairly sure I've got that the right way around. Um, you can see that this is work match. So these are doing the same intensity of exercise in these two bouts. In this one, they removed some of the, um, some of the cost of breathing from the respiratory muscles. They aided, they assisted breathing. And you can see that the amount of fatigue experienced by the quadriceps was significantly reduced. In contrast, when they increased the burden on the respiratory muscles, the amount of fatigue was increased, demonstrating that role of the, res the central respiratory system in your ability to undertake exercise. And this is most likely to be related to the respiratory muscle metab metabolic reflex, whereby increased work of breathing results in increased um, afferent feedback to the respiratory control center in the brain, which then increases sympathetic outflow, increases vasoconstriction, so it makes your arteries go smaller, which reduces the amount of oxygen that's getting to your working muscles, increasing perceptions of fatigue and actual fatigue. So the reason I'm trying to highlight this is to show that by potentially finding a rehabilitation strategy that helps to address this breathlessness, we can also help to address many of the other symptoms associated with long COVID, one of the other principal ones of which is fatigue. Now, the conventional way in which we would set about doing this would have been a traditional pulmonary rehabilitation program, which is a multi-component program, normally over six to eight weeks, and which are highly effective in a number of different respiratory conditions. But they wouldn't work in the times that we were in, in COVID. They are reliant, A, on healthcare systems, which we couldn't add further burden to. They are also predominantly reliant on in-person group-based activities, which were clearly not an option when we were all locked in our own homes. So having identified these limitations with the conventional and approach that we would have normally fallen back on, we wondered whether or not there might be a role of respiratory muscle training. So respiratory muscle training uses a restricted airflow to effectively act as resistance training for your muscles involved in breathing, aiming to elicit a hypertrophic response similar to that that you would see in your skeletal muscles if it were genuine, um, normal resistance training. And in other respiratory conditions, such as COPD, asthma, respiratory muscle training has been shown to be very effective and to elicit meaningful changes in breathlessness, improvements in quality of life and functional capacity. And it's something that we had previously identified in other chronic conditions as well, such as um, non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. So we were very fortunate that we managed to secure some funding to enable us to conduct a study looking at respiratory muscle training during the lockdowns. We over-recruited, this is the only study I've ever conducted where I ended up with a wait list for people who wanted to take part. Um, and we um, randomized over 200 people in the end to the intervention group and had 50 people in our control group who did subsequently get the intervention. Those in our intervention group were asked to undertake respiratory muscle training three times a week for eight weeks. Now, there are two unique things about this study. First of all was the type of respiratory muscle training that we got people to engage in. So most respiratory muscle trainers just get you to do a maximal effort and then the resistance goes. The unique thing about this device was that it required you to train throughout the range. So that whole inspiratory effort, you were working against a resistance. The other unique thing about this study was that it was done entirely remotely. We never met a single one of these participants in person. We spent an awful long time on Zoom, um, but it also made it more ecologically valid. We weren't looking to develop another research study that would show, yes, in an ideal world, this could work. We were looking at could we identify something that might actually feasibly be implementable by healthcare systems, that it only required them to have an initial session to introduce the concept, to train them how to do it, and then leave them alone with no contact for eight weeks and to see what effect that had. So throughout this, we um, took measures of breathlessness, quality of life, device-based physical activity, um, estimated aerobic fitness, and we did some more qualitative interviews because apparently that's what I do these days. <laughs> and we found that this eight-week training program was very effective. 
It significantly reduced breathlessness, as shown here by the King's Brief Interstitial Lung Disease Questionnaire. It reduced, um, improved all the outcomes as shown in blue. And importantly, it did this well in excess of what is considered minimally clinically important. So we're not just talking about statistical significance or those things that all of us as researchers love to claim makes it important. This is actually, according to the thresholds that have been identified as that will make a difference, a, a perceivable difference for the patients. We demonstrated that we were well in excess of that across these various different measures. This was most likely to be attributable to the significant increases in respiratory muscle strength that were elicited throughout this program, which also translated to significant improvements in estimated cardiorespiratory fitness and in physical activity levels and reduced sedentary time. But perhaps most um, encouragingly, perhaps most meaningfully, it also translated to the participants' perceptions, with them describing how they could now engage in activities that they'd given up hope of ever being able to do again. They've been able to return to work. I'm not sure why that's a good thing, but they perceived it as it. So I've only presented a very small subset of the results from that study, and we've still got a lot of work to do. There's still a lot more to come out of it. And this is especially true as the waves of COVID keep coming. The numbers of long COVID are not going down anytime soon, and our healthcare systems remain unable to address that need for rehabilitation. So there is much more that needs to be done in this area. So before we come to the end of this presentation, um, I'd just like to say a few, a few thank yous. Um, as Kelly mentioned, there's been a huge number of collaborators along the way, and I can't mention them all today, but don't please let that think I don't value the input and uh, support all along the way. But there are a few people that I want to specifically mention and take this opportunity to thank. So first of all, to Andy and to Kirsten, thank you very much for your belief in me from the outset and your confidence. I definitely wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for it. Um, to Neil, Gareth, Liam and Mike, Thank you for your ongoing encouragement and all of the uh, opportunities you've given me. Uh, to Karen, thank you for your probably unwitting mentorship and wisdom. I wish I could remember more of it, but you gave me too much gin alongside it. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you to Whippus and all the fantastic people involved in it, but especially Rachel, Catherine and Amy. Although Amy, I haven't forgiven you for turning it into a gift yet. Um, <laughs> And finally, thank you to my greatest collaborator in every sense of the word, Kelly. Thank you also to the students, a few of which are here today, both past and present. Um, you've taught me far more than I've ever managed to teach any single one of you. And it's been a pleasure to be a small part of your stories as well. And finally, to my family, to whom I owe my greatest thanks, and starting with my dogs, our dogs, I should say. Um, <laughs> um, especially to Tizo, who was literally by my side from my undergraduate to my professorship, to the point where she was even acknowledged in some of my students' theses. Um, thank you also to my family, to Hilary and Dennis, Alex, Mum, Dad, Ian and Erin. Um, it has been a very long journey since the little girl who used to hide behind the sofa because she couldn't, was too shy to meet her um, cousins, and also the one that literally refused to talk to the point that the healthcare nurses thought I couldn't talk. Um, but again, your love and support has made it all possible. To Kelly, thank you. I'm indescribably proud of everything that you've achieved. Um, and to Lexi, if you ever have to suffer through watching this presentation when you're older, um, I just want you to know that you are my greatest accomplishment. Thank you. certainly something that we've debated a lot and also to follow up with the people like yourself who are involved in the initial study to see where they are now. Um, as always, it comes down to a question of funding. 
and unfortunately funding for long COVID research is extremely hard to come by. The National Institute of um, Health Research gave out one large pot of money and have pretty much walked away from it ever since. So it's quite hard to follow up, but it's certainly something that we will be interested to do. And if we know we've got participants who are willing to come back and talk to us, then even more likes to happen. We debated it. Um, we did toss up whether or not it would be better to do inspiratory or expiratory, but because of the passive nature of expiratory, of expiration, we felt it was more important to concentrate on that inspiratory effort. Um, and it's also where there's more evidence with regard to um, the potential reasons behind breathlessness. So things like that um, diaphragm dysfunction are less likely to be manifest during the expiration. So that's why we focused. Um, are healthcare systems at the moment using the same kind of studies, uh, using the same intervention? Um, COVID. Um, I'd love to say yes, that was certainly where we intended it to go, um, but it is a very closed door and it's extremely hard to push that one open. Um, there are pockets where people have picked up respiratory muscle training, typically in spiratory, but it's not as widespread as we would like, which is why there's so much more work to do. Um, there are some, there is some much more advanced approaches to rehabilitation in the US, as you can imagine, um, and they have more widely picked it up than we have achieved in the UK. One more. Do you think that the inspiratory training that you've just mentioned could be attributed to swimming and being able to do maybe uh, less breathing with an unbreathing piece of there? Yeah, the, the, the whole field of inspiratory muscle training obviously started very much in performance arenas and the jury's out really as to where it works and where it doesn't work and it's very sport specific. One of the few sports in which it does work is swimming and that's because of the supine position and the increased um, cost of breathing against the resistance of water. So it does appear to work for swimming. Whether or not that translates to changes in performance, it's a bit questionable. Maybe I can ask the last question. It's really just a curiosity. I mean, one of the things which um, attracted my attention was the advantage of gain through exercise is fast resolution. You said you were going to do some work. take it is first of all to understand a little bit more about what the relationships between air pollution and health are especially in pediatric populations so a lot of the information we have at the moment is based on adults but we know that children are likely to be exposed to even more air pollution than their adult counterparts because they do engage in some active travel to school some of them at least um, and also when they do they're at that much lower level closer to things like traffic um, vehicle exhausts and also they have a higher respiratory rate. So they're at much more danger from exposure to air pollution. So we're, we've been doing some work, first of all, to understand what their perceptions are of air pollution. Do they understand what it is? There's some massive global air pollution campaigns, but it appears that that's not translating to understanding. So we're working in that area. And then the way in which we want to go is to develop um, just-in-time interventions. So these are meant to be sophisticated interventions that respond to where you have been, what you're doing, and where you need to go in terms of how much activity is left that you need to accrue throughout that day, so that we can try and nudge people in an intelligent way, a way that accounts for, actually, you're in a really polluted area, it's probably best you don't go out and engage in something, or you've been really inactive, so we think that the relative benefit lies in being active and risk the exposure to air pollution. So it's a very challenging area that we're trying to move into, one that will involve computer science, undoubtedly, but potentially quite rewarding if we can if we can get it to work. <coughs> With that, I think that we are uh, going to conclude the second lecture. Before I do that, do we have a bunch of questions? <laughs> <laughs>